Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Ricky Camilleri. Welcome to Build. Uh, in 1978, Colorado Springs detective Ron Stallworth infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan, duping everyone from local members to the Grand Wizard himself, David Duke. The twist? Ron Stallworth is black. The crazy, improbable story of how Stallworth did it is now being brought to the big screen by producer Jordan Peele and the god, director Spike Lee. Black Klansman is frightening, hilarious, thrilling, and brilliantly resonant in our current political and cultural climate, and it is easily one of the best films of the year. Let's take a look. There's never been a black cop in this city. We think you might be the man to open things up around here. Hello, this is Ron Stallworth calling. Well, who am I speaking with? This is David Duke. Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. That David Duke? God. Last time I checked. Well, what can I do you for? Well, since you asked, I hate blacks. I hate Jews, Mexicans, and Irish, Italians, and Chinese. But my mouth to God's ears, I really hate those black rats. And anyone else, really, that doesn't have pure white Aryan blood running through their veins. I'm happy to be talking to a true white American. God bless white America. The KKK is planning an attack. How do you propose to make this investigation? We'll establish contact over the phone. We'll need a white officer to play me when they meet face to face. You for the white race, Ron? Oh, hell yeah. So there becomes a combined Ron Stallworth. Can you do that? With the right white man, we can do anything. When's the last time they let a rookie lead an investigation? Oh, that's right. Never. <laughs> OK. Become his friend. Let's get invited back. So what kind of stuff you guys do? Cross burdens, marches. This is fixing to be a big year for us. You asked too many questions. You undercover or something? We must unite and organize to fight racism. Are you down for the liberation of black people? Power to the people. All power to all the people. All power to all the people. It's right, sister. For you, it's a crusade. For me, it's a job. You're Jewish. That hatred, doesn't that piss you off? You're taking this Jew lie detector test. Why are you acting like you ain't got skin in the game? I'm telling you, the wars are coming. Black power! Black power! Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. That's us, Stallworth brothers. We're on a roll, baby. Everybody, please welcome from Black Klansmen, Topher Grace, Jasper Pacone, and Ryan Eggle, Corey Hawkins, Laura Harrier, and the man himself, Ron Stallworth. This is the real Ron Stallworth, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, sir. My pleasure. Congratulations on not just getting a movie made of your story, but getting a Spike Lee movie made of your story, and also one of the great Spike Lee movies made. It is a phenomenal film. Congratulations, Thank sir. you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> it sounds so easy for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's great. Spike Lee, whatever. Um, let's talk about how... How did you feel when you found out that they were going to adapt your book in, into a movie? It is very easily the kind of thing that could get messed up by uh, the wrong producers or the wrong writers. Well, first of all, this was a four-year process and this movie could not have been made at any other time except the time in which uh, it was turned over to Spike and uh, he brought it to life. Uh, no other director could have uh, brought this movie to life with the exception of Spike Lee. Um, but when it got into the hands of QC Entertainment and they turned it over to Jordan, Jordan contacted Spike, things started rolling and uh, we were off and running. What, did, what was the first conversation that you had with, with Spike about, like, about the film? I didn't. You didn't? Spike uh, brought my wife and I to uh, uh, his studio, 40 Acres and a Mule, uh, a year ago uh, this October for the cast read-through. That was the first time I had talked to him or, or uh, had any contact with him. And um, uh, he asked me to address the cast to tell them the story. Uh, I think most, if not all of them, had not read the book. So I uh, basically told them the story and uh, responded to any questions they might have. And uh, Spike told everyone to put me on speed dial so that they could contact me if they had any further questions, which uh, I did get uh, texts and uh, phone calls from John David and uh, Adam Driver a couple of times. Um, but that's, uh, that was my only contact with Spike was that day. 
Now, you said there's no way this movie could be made uh, in any other time than right now, and I, f I absolutely agree with you on that, and I think the movie uh, shows that in, in a lot of ways. What were your first thoughts when you saw the film and you saw the ways in which um, Spike and the writers made it as culturally resonant as they did? Well, first, I, I was in awe when I was uh, watching it for the first time. I've seen it three times, the last time being last night. And I was in awe of uh, sitting there, hearing my words coming out of the mouths of these, these folks, uh, seeing uh, events that I actually participated in 40 years ago uh, occurring, reoccurring. And uh, some of it was pretty accurate. Some of it they took a liberty or two here. But for the most part, it's a pretty accurate depiction of uh, what I went through. And uh, it was kind of surreal to recognize that something I had written just to tell a story. I, I wrote this book just to tell my story. I felt it was unique. Who would believe a black man could go undercover in the Ku Klux Klan? <laughs> That's a unique story. So I wanted to tell that story, and I wanted to explain the process of uh, what it took to make that case, and what I went through personally in terms of my career, uh, I had no other intention in mind, and it turned into a movie. Now, uh, uh, you know, after after the case was done, you were essentially forced to hide all record, destroy all records of it. You hid a lot of them so that in the future you were able to tell the story. Um, with this movie coming out, do you feel kind of vindicated in any way? Well, first of all, I didn't hide it uh, in order to tell the story. I took it from the office in violation of department policy. My career was, uh, at that point, was in jeopardy. Had I been caught, I could have been fired. But I did it because, again, it was a unique investigation. To the best of my knowledge, no one had done what I had done, and I didn't want the proof of that to evaporate. Uh, so basically, when no one was looking in my office after being ordered to destroy the files, uh, I shredded a report here, a report there. When no one was looking, I took the two notebooks and uh, put them under my arm and just walked out the door and took them home with me, and I still am in possession of them. And it's from those notebooks that I wrote my book. That's where all the information came from. Um, do I feel vindicated? Um, I felt vindicated the minute I argued with the chief of police about not destroying them. Uh, I thought it was a bad order. I thought the order uh, was wrong. Quite frankly, I didn't think it deserved to be obeyed. And I took the chance of uh, doing what I did, recognizing the uh, ramifications of what could happen had I uh, got caught. Now, um, I want to move on to the rest of the cast in just a second, but it's Ron Stallworth is here. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, you know, last question before we move on to the rest of the cast. Uh, you dupe David Duke, essentially, uh, in the both in the book and in the film. And uh, what has it been like um, 30, 30 years later to see him kind of have a bit of a resurgence in the public eye in the mainstream due to Charlottesville and due to the rhetoric coming out of the president's mouth that has sort of allowed someone like him to flourish once again. What is it like to see him speaking, having known what he's actually like on a, on a, on a personal level and how sort of smart he is <laughs> person to person? It was fun duping uh, Topher Grace, let me put it that way. Uh, st stop. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps calling me David. It's not cool. <laughs> Dave, Dave, Dave. Oh, Topher, sorry, sorry, no. <laughs> I had fun uh, making the case. Uh, uh, it was fun making a fool of David Duke uh, and the whole white supremacist ideology of uh, racial superiority based on uh, white skin. Um, I had fun proving him false. Um, how do I feel about it now? David Duke is irrelevant. Uh, his relevancy ended about 1980 or so. Uh, he's still a voice out there. He will always be a voice out there. But in terms of the uh, position he held back then, he really doesn't have that. Um, when he got made a fool of, uh, and this story first broke nationally in 2006, uh, one of the uh, websites, Stormfront, uh, that was up, run by Don Black, who was the California Grand Dragon under David Duke. Don Black organized Stormfront in order to appeal to young people about what the white racist movement was all about and win converts over to them through the uh, rapidly expansion, expanding uh, website, internet site. When this story first broke, Stormfront 
put a full page color photo of me on their in their magazine along with uh, what they thought was my home address and phone number it wasn't but they thought it was uh, and basically they were telling their their followers that this is who this guy is this is the man that made a fool out of David Duke and they actually said that and they talked about how we need to take precautions about not allowing this to happen again we need to uh, vet these people before we let them into our organizations so that we don't get duped like David Duke did. And uh, Stormfront, uh, that, that website had about eight or ten pages of conversational thread calling me the N-word and uh, threatening to uh, do something to me if they could ever catch me and everything. Was I scared? I was laughing at it. I found it hilarious that uh, we had uh, kicked them in the gut to such an extent that they had to respond this way, and I still find amusement out of it. So uh, David Duke is not of relevance anymore, but his voice is out there. He needs to still be recognized as the uh, monster that he is. As I say in the book, uh, he was a pleasant conversationalist to talk to, very pleasant. Any one of you would love talking to a David Duke. The minute, though, the subject turned to race, Dr. Jekyll becomes Mr. Hyde, and the monster in him was unleashed. And that's the threat of David Duke, is he puts on this persona of being such a good all-American kid that a uh, nice guy everybody would like to talk to, but in reality, he's a monster, okay? And uh, you have to keep that in mind when you deal with white supremacists, um, that uh, there, there, there's a darker side to them. Now, the three of you uh, play white supremacists in the film, Tover. You play David Duke, and you do a really great job of playing someone who, on the surface, as he said, presents himself as a pleasant conversationalist, a decent guy, but is actually of abhorrent beliefs and opinions. What were your first thoughts when you decided to play David Duke? Well, I thought that the script did a really great job of... Uh, David's not in kind of the first half of the movie, and they show uh, what the common idea of a racist might have been in the early 70s, which is uh, like a redneck, beer belly guy. And then uh, when David enters the film, kind of the same thing happens as when David got on the scene in America. Is he, the most evil thing about him is kind of how well-spoken he is, how smart he is, like Ron was saying. And so... Uh, the, he kind of rebranded racism. Uh, we talk about in the film, he only wears three-piece suits. Uh, he never wears the hood in public. So uh, I remember thinking, just reading the script, it was kind of a lesson in, oh, this is uh, something that has its roots and something that's going on today. Uh, a kind of a, a readjustment of racism, making it more palatable for more people, which makes it what he did more evil, in my opinion. Um, but then the idea of playing it was like, terrifying because I've never played a character or anything like this so I went and met with Spike and uh, he made me feel very comfortable. There are zero other directors that I would do this with besides Spike Lee. There's, yeah, there's a difference between playing a villain who could be hated by the end of the movie and you, you, know, you want the hero to, to win over that villain and playing a real life villain who's still alive and represents so much disgust and, and, and hatred in our culture. Yeah, people would say, uh, actors usually say, um, you should find something that you agree with in the character uh, or, or something where you can, like, you personally can root for him, even if it's a villain, like you're playing the Joker or something. You've got to find something from his point of view that uh, makes you empathize with the character. Um, I couldn't do it. I did a lot of research on this character. I read his autobiography, which is horrible. Ron, have you read it? You Yes. I've read a few pages of it, but like uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf, yeah. unless you're into that ideology, you can't get through it. It's it was it's like the worst months of my life doing that research. It was um, <laughs> watching a lot of filmed interviews of him from the 70s. He was actually on a few episodes of Donahue in the early 80s, which was really interesting watching him interact with a crowd that didn't like him. He's actually, this is where you see how evil he is because he's really good with the crowd. Mm -hmm. Even though they hate him, they, they, he's like a, the more research I did, the more he I... Loved, he loved those shows. I mean, that's a, sort of a problem that we have right now, is the more shocking these people are, the more... Are I don't know who you're talking about in particular, but you are right. There are some leaders <laughs> who are very charismatic and very into media, 
and uh, they garner a lot of attention and run their rallies nonstop on our on our. I'm not talking networks. about anyone in particular. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, he's free advertising. I mean, I'm not sure exactly who we're referring, but yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. don't know who you're talking about. But I, uh, a lot of, by the way, a lot of leaders over time have been very charismatic and good with the media at the time, and um, it makes them more dangerous uh, because their message gets out uh, wider. For me, it was uh, really the most depressing month of my life. Just uh, spending all that time in that. Um, in that place, and it's why you have to work with a great leader like Spike Lee, because he knows how to uh, come up. To, even some of the days we shot where it was clan stuff, he'd kind of come up to me and kind of uh, pat my back and say, like, hey, you know, you're serving my message, and uh, I know what I'm doing, and I'm Spike Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, it made it okay. It never felt great. I'd like to point out one thing for your audience. Topher did an outstanding job uh, replicating David Duke in this film. When I watched it, there are moments in this film where he sounds exactly like David Duke of 1978 that I was talking to on the phone. There are moments in that film where he looks exactly like David Duke of 1978 that I uh, met in person. Um, I have nothing but high regards for what he did and his portrayal of uh, that uh, despicable character. And never have Ron, you been... thank you, by the way. That, that means a lot. Seriously, coming from Ron, that means a lot. I was going to say, though, never have you been more uncomfortable with a compliment about your performance before <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, from Ron, that... Uh, I remember at the table read, I had started that research, and he kind of told me, you're on the right track, and gave me permission to, to go there. Uh, Laura, Corey, uh, Corey, you play Stokely Carmichael. You give an amazing, uh, you have an amazing speech, and I really love that sequence of the film because it's a wonderful showcase of how Spike takes something from a script and turns it into his own and makes it something completely different. And the way that he has those slow fade-ins of the shots of the listeners and the way they're taking in the information. And I wonder, as as actors, if you have any idea that's how he's shooting it. If that's going to come off, if he talks to you about that that's going to come off on the big screen. Because as a viewer, as someone who loves Spike's work, it's why you go to his movies so often, because he knows how to take something and make it different and make it masterful. And that's such a wonderful example of that. I don't think we were aware of no, the I don't final think so. pod. <laughs> Spike really you know, has his process and, and stays by that. But I mean, in that during that scene, in that moment, Corey's performance is so incredible. And um, you know, the, the speech that he gave, I think those words are still so relevant for right now. And um, it was amazing seeing you know, that, that first take that you did and how much that affected the energy in the room. And you could see you know, all the extras, everyone sitting there was completely riveted. And they were really you know, involved in this and involved what, in what he was saying. And um, Spike is really incredible, I think, at creating a very real feeling situation when we're in um, when we're on set yeah well, what kind of research did you guys do for your parts I mean you're based on a, a real person your character I imagine is kind of an amalgamation of a, of a number of people but I'm wondering what sort of research uh, you did um, you know for me I mean it's it's again it's like you're stepping into uh, anytime you take on a character there's there's research to be done but but with a, a character that has a legacy, whether he's living or, or, or has passed on, um, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, honor that you have to bring to it. And, and Spike, you know, he, he, he laid that in. And, you know, he was very, uh, we, we talked a lot about, um, about honoring Kwame Ture's uh, spirit and, and his, his, his legacy and, and what he was preaching. Um, you know, I mean, it got to the, you know, Spike is like, I, I, I need you to go, you know, do this, and I, I need you to read this book. And stop do, texting do, like, you. Like, really is very <laughs> yeah, involved with yeah. all of us about, about, and that's the, that's the thing about Spike. He's very detail oriented, and he's very passionate, and that separates him from a lot of, uh, a lot of directors. Um, and for this, for me, for Kwame, um, there, there's there's everything you know about him that's out there. But for me, what was interesting was the 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 little things, you know, like his charm, you know, um, his 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 wit, 
you know, the humor that he had and the, the, the charisma that he had. Yeah, from all the people I spoke to about that would hear him speak, you know, uh, they, they talked about how there was that lean in factor, that he, he was just the kind of guy that inspired um, action in, in people in a beautiful way. And he spoke about love, but it was crazy sitting there talk, saying these words about police shooting you know, black people in the backs in the streets like dogs, race, by, being, by being shot by white racist cops. And then telling these words, like we said, to these extras who hadn't heard, heard it before, who were sitting there like, is, he, is this 1970s or, or, or are we talking about today? You know, and, it's like and, the intention of the whole movie. Every scene of the movie pops as if it could be happening right now and exactly. not within the 70s. Exactly, and, um, and I think he, you know, Spike is just like, we didn't know that they, like, yeah. we saw him sh stealing extras and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, stealing background artists and, and, and um, putting them in, in the back and shooting their faces and, and really allowing them to be a part of this film and, and speaking to them in between takes and talking to them about the history, about this, getting up and playing music from the times. And we would, by at one point, we were doing the electric slide. and We were all about yeah, dancing. We were just, we just were, having such yeah. a good time. I mean, I'm sure it was different from For that guys, experience. But, uh, uh, but <laughs> we were having a great time. <laughs> Only slightly. Only slightly. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was full. It was uh, lived in. And, and I think it serves, again, the, the message of the film. And you guys have a scene uh, in the bar that I would I would say is within the pantheon of like Spike Lee, uh, sort of what he does. I think that of Do the Right Thing, and I think of Twenty Fifth Hour, where he has these montage sequences of people throwing out racial slurs. He's so in tune with how slurs have an effect on people, and I think whereas most filmmakers would have that scene in the bar with the two of you and they'd throw out the N-word and they'd move on with the story. He really wants it to hurt. He really wants it to slam. And so the two of you are kind of forced, I think, to say it hundreds of times, it sounds like, in that scene. What was, what was that like as, as actors? Um, unenjoyable. Uh, it, sure. It, you know, I was talking about this with Laura last night, with everybody, with Topher, with, you know, you... you Take creatively, it's exciting to play a character who's so far from yourself, who has such an extremist ideology, who is despicable in many ways, who's not charming. Uh, personally, it's it's hard because you have to kind of shed that, you know, decency and integrity and and get comfortable, as Topher was saying earlier, with some really um, some really ugly stuff. Um, and you're not playing a villain who gets to chew scenery or anything, or who kind of gets to be really big and, and hilarious. You're playing a, a human villain. Right, and I think to apologize for it as the character would, to, would be a disservice to Ron's story and the battle that he was fighting. You know, you don't want to play these guys as other kind of rude or rough around the edges. You want to play them as, you know, as, as accurately and as honestly uh, as you can. But yeah, and then seeing it, you know, for the first time, <laughs> um, and Spike sort of jump cut some of that language together, it's really, um, powerful, and um, I'm just really glad I don't have that mustache right now. And I guess <clears throat> the fact that Spike just reminded us all the time that we're on the right side of history for, for us playing the white supremacists, um, that would be something that, that's all you need to know and all you need to hear from, from a director like Spike Lee. Like Topher said, uh, I can't think of any other director in this country that I would have felt a way comfortable saying those horrible things because you know that it's Spike Lee and you know that he has a he has a message um, and you know it's going to be tonally right and there's no risk of of going the wrong way especially with these these terrible characters that we're playing. Spike in fact toned it down a little bit um, in the sense that uh, Topher's character in real life, David Duke was throwing the N-word around and with me on the phone. We had a good time batting it back and forth. Uh, that was his style. He didn't say it in public because that would have destroyed his image. But on the phone in our conversations, he was throwing the N-word around left and right. You don't see that depicted in the film. You know, you don't see Topher saying uh, the N-word, I don't believe. I, I did at one point. At one? It wasn't my favorite day of shooting. But uh, he, <laughs> there was some stuff that was cut in one of the phone calls where, I think just because it was, uh, the whole section was cut, where Spike came in 
sometimes if you're an actor and you're working with a comedy director and they want to tell you something that you should improvise, they'll kind of come in and just whisper it in your ear. So then you tell the joke and it's kind of the first time the cast and crew hears the joke. <laughs> so at the end of one of these phone calls, he came in, I mean, I won't even repeat what he told me to say, but he came in and whispered this thing in my ear. And I said, hey, Spike, no need to whisper it. <laughs> like, please tell everyone that you wanted me to say this. Like, I don't want everyone to be like, whoa, great improv, Topher. Like, this is the ra most racist thing you've ever said. Like, <laughs> Everybody in the crew giving you bad looks the rest of the day. If you say that out loud in front of everyone, I will repeat you, but that's it. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a question out here? Right here? Hi, everybody. Uh, I was lucky enough to see the film last night, and uh, you truly crafted a thought-provoking, funny, stick-with-you-for-a-long-time kind of movie, so thank you for that. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, so throughout the movie, there are a lot of ideologies being shared, some positive, some obviously very negative, and I was wondering how important it was for everybody to really get those messages across to truly... Um, show what it was like back then. Laura? I mean, I don't know. For me, I, I thought a lot about the, the messages of, you know, Black Power and the Black Panther movement and stuff. Um, but I, I think, like we were kind of talking about this morning, um, I, I tried to not be aware of what they, those things mean currently today, just kind of from... I guess a sort of selfish actory standpoint. I didn't want to. Um, I wanted to really stay in that time, and obviously we knew this was going to have like larger repercussions, and it really is, you know, poignant to our current time. But um, during the shooting, I felt like I couldn't really think about that too much, or it would kind of like change the the time period and like the thought process for my character. So, yeah. I think it just in terms of uh, in terms of tone and messaging, and um, you, again, you never know what what the film ultimately is gonna be. All we're doing is just taking a risk. That's that's what we should be doing, is just throwing throwing it out there with purpose, but but you know, ultimately the film is gonna land how it lands on different people. And for us, I mean, it, it's gonna hit home no matter, you know, whether we're talking about border security or we're talking about, you know, whatever we're talking, whatever the 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 you know, we're talking about. The focus is that humanity and these in, in, in love versus hate and where you fall on that spectrum and where we sometimes unknowingly fall on that spectrum and just asking those questions, man. And, and I mean, for me, it, like just what rang home really for the first time for me seeing the film yesterday as well was was women in this film and, and the power that they have and watching Laura portray this character who is, you know, trying to fight for the liberation of black people and and also, you know, fighting for her her rights and her, you know, where she falls on the spectrum. Because not only is she black, but she's a woman as well. And she so, you know, and that that it was the first time I, I was like really hearing those notes with everything going on politically as well. And I think Spike is just Again, and I say it all the time, but he's a curator of the culture. Like he reminds us what's going on, no matter what's what the, important right now. Exactly, yeah. it's a lot of distraction. He just like, nah, we're gonna focus on. Don't don't forget this. Especially with Charlottesville, you know, that was only a year ago, and I feel like he, I, we know that's happened, but it, it's not, you know, it's not currently discussed right now, and um, it's so important to not normalize these things and not forget. Exactly, um, you know, these atrocities no. that are happening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, I have sort of a follow-up for Tofert's two-part question, but you had said how difficult it was for you preparing for this role. Now that you're on the other side of it, like, is there, do you feel like it's rewarding? Do, what does it feel like now? I mean, usually you feel happy when you're, you're, you know, doing press and stuff, but I, I don't, can't imagine what this feels like. I, I'm thrilled because I've seen the movie. I trusted Spike to, uh, make the movie that I'd read. A lot of times as an actor, you read the script, you have high hopes for the project. It's so hard to make a movie. It really takes a master of cinema like Spike to make something uh, that's the same along the way. It was the same thing when I read it as when we shot it, as when I saw it. And I'm so thrilled because the tone, um, especially of a character like David, but the tone of the whole film uh, balances some you know, humorous 
aspects, some uh, like devastating aspects. And uh, once I saw it, I thought what my hope was at the beginning was that um, I understood what David's uh, utility was within the film. I didn't want to play David Duke in a TV movie of the week. Like I have no yen to play David Duke <laughs> or do all that research. I wanted to play David Duke in a Spike Lee joint. And and given the current climate, I know you guys touched on it, but for you specifically for that role, what did it mean to you to do that? And how, how did you get through that given what's going on? In well, the my world? wife would tell you that I was like just terrible <laughs> for a couple of months. It was, uh, uh, I was depressed from doing all that research. But at the same time, it was also a really cathartic experience because um, we just had a daughter, so we had our first. And um, like I'd be rehearsing lines, and she'd be like, hey, can you like chill out with the hate speech right now? Like our daughter's two weeks old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, t you know, acting can be a silly job. Like we're playing pretend for a living. Uh, but every once in a while, you get to be part of something that's important. Something that Spike, it's really what Spike is saying here, but we all got to help him a little bit, say something that's, you know, now on a national level. Um, and when my daughter was being born, uh, it's a very confusing world that I'm bringing her into. So it was so cathartic to be part of a project that um, maybe in a small way we could, we could say something. And the current political climate doesn't just touch the film in terms of the specific scenes that feel like, like as I said, they, they could resonate and pop now, but the film itself, without giving anything away, really does intentionally try to touch on the current political climate, and it almost becomes a horror film, kind of a kind of call-to-action horror movie once you reach the end, where this sort of dark comedy, the rug has come out from under you, and you realize that all of this is kind of deathly serious. And yeah, I've been calling it, because the, the films, you know, takes place in the 70s, and you kind of, it's at an arm's length, but I've been calling the ending, um, you know, the calls coming from inside the house. Yeah. <laughs> it chops off that arm that yeah, keeps yeah. it at length. It's like sitting in your lap by the end of it. By the way, first shot of the movie, spoiler, but first shot of the movie uh, takes is the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Last shot of the movie is 2017. Only someone like Spike Lee could draw that line. What did you, were you guys aware while shooting that he was going to take it there at, at the end? Like, did the script no. have anything like that in it? No. No, not at all. Not until we saw it for the first time. So almost. like at Cannes, you guys saw it. And yeah, we were at Cannes and we saw the movie for the first Everybody time. And then it ended like that. And everyone was uh, like, <gasps> That's awesome. And it was super intense. It was yeah. pretty amazing. I mean, awesome, but it was, you know. It, it was intense. Everybody, because yeah. you, you literally go from the humor. And, and that's the other thing is that the humor and, and laughing and, and, you know, throughout the pain of it all. But you literally go from that to a gut punch mm -hmm. and a wake up call and a call to action. That's exactly really what it is and we were all sitting there silent and again last night everybody was just silent yeah. Ron what did you think what did you think when you saw that for the first time I was mesmerized I sat I sat in my seat for the last uh, five ten minutes literally stone face silence mesmerized by what uh, what I was seeing uh, if you all have not seen the movie, you will understand when you do go see it, uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, it is such a powerful movie, and that scene in particular at the ending is extremely powerful. Uh, Topher hit it on the head. Spike connects the historical thread from the Confederacy to uh, Charlottesville and, and events in between. Uh, and that's essentially what this movie is about. Racism is alive and well. It has been around in this uh, country, uh, in our nation, throughout our nation's history. Uh, it reached a peak during the Civil War with slavery, and then the 600,000 uh, people that died as a result of the Civil War. Uh, it died down a little bit after that, and it uh, was resurrected around 1915 or so with the movie Birth of a Nation, and uh, it died down a little bit, and then the 50s hit us, and we had uh, the Klan and White Citizens Council, which were nothing more than Klan members in suits in official government offices, and uh, it went into the 60s, and then in the 70s, here comes David Duke, 
There is a historical thread to all this, and Spike weaves it very, very well. Absolutely. Um, next question. I think we have time for one more. Right here. As actors, what were the most challenging aspects on working on this film? I actually don't Theme. have the time to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so, I, I mean, for me, it was the research. Um, the doing of it was actually fun. Uh, it's, it's a terrible man, but it's a really juicy role. Uh, so, and, and doing with Spike and this amazing cast, that was easy. It was, for me, it was uh, trying to get into someone's headspace when it's the most polar opposite of me as I could imagine. One thing that the three of you do in your performances, which I thought was so, so smart and so well calibrated, which is ignorance. The three of your characters have moments of being stunningly ignorant and hilariously stupid. But within a second, like just, just as the end of the movie does, the rug comes out and you realize how dangerous that ignorance is and how much of their ideology is, is fueled by a sort of hostile stupidity. And I'm wondering if you can talk about calibrating that. And I mean, especially you, Jasper, I think you, you and the character and the, the woman who plays your wife, you do such a wonderful job in the scenes together where your intimacy is based upon your, your hatred and, and your ignorance. And at times it's hilarious, but it's also terrifying. Can you talk about walking that line? Right, right. and I guess as an actor playing a role like this, you, your responsibility is to play a human being that, that the audience actually believes in. And if you, if you played it towards a more caricature like um, a guy um, that you can just kind of shrug off as, as, as a stupid racist idiot, um, it wouldn't have the same impact. But the fact that, that um, all of the white supremacist roles are people that you actually believe in and, uh, and think that they could be, you know, the guy you see in the supermarket um, makes it all the more impactful and all, all the more frightening. Um, so as an actor, I felt like the, uh, the responsibility is to, uh, to play somebody who's real and who's not just just a, uh, a caricature of a, of a racist idiot. And to find those subtle moments where, where you know, you give a little bit of depth yep. uh, to that character that, that the audience starts believing in, 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 in your character hopefully makes it all the more impactful to, uh, to understand that these guys really exist. Do you want to talk about that? No, no, I mean, these guys, um said it all, you know, I, I, you, um, you feel like you're just an instrument in the orchestra that, that Spike and that, that Ron um, have created and you play your part and if your part is this ideology, you, you sort of embody it, you know, as honestly as you can to present that. It's also, I think, you know, for me it was interesting to, just as an actor, just, uh, you know, to, as a person rather, to sort of try to understand it, to really try to understand it, where this, how this kind of hate is born where it comes from. I watched a documentary about these, these poor white kids who come from a broken home, and then there was this neo-Nazi who was taking them in and saying, this is the reason your life is bad. Blame these people or that people. And they had never met some of the people they supposedly hated in, in real life. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It was just really interesting to sort of understand and um, you know see how that's born, especially with Ron trying to figure out how do you combat that what can you do about it how do we how do you communicate with someone like that and how do you get you know uh how do you move forward from there to better do you want to talk about the hardest parts of, about your performances for me you know the the research was the fun part. I got to, you know, really become familiar with these incredible strong women of, of the Black Power movement. But um, the most difficult part was definitely, um, I guess, a scene we shot where my character is um, assaulted by a police officer, and that was really difficult. Like, you know, we're together in that scene, and um, emotionally, just like for us as actors to go through that, and you know, we were in a safe space, and Spike is really great at being. Um, you know, making you feel comfortable and protected and stuff. But my thoughts just kept going to, you know, Sandra Bland and Philando Castile and Eric Garner and, you know, the countless um, people of color who have been brutalized by police officers and, you know, have, have had that happen and lost their lives. So, um, you know, that was really difficult to think about. And 
at the same time really important, I think, to, to illustrate on screen because we have to keep these conversations going and um, not, um, not let it be swept under the rug. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I agree. Um, I mean, for me, it, it, I, I have a sort of uh, smaller time on the, like I, I literally only shot two days. Spike was like, I just need you to come do two days, man. I was like, I'll give you two months, I'll give you two years, bro, whatever you need. It's Spike Lee. Um, but uh, so I guess the, the challenge there is, is um, trying to distill, um, you know, as much as I can in uh, truth, the honesty, you know, just in, into that speech. Um, and also that, that scene was, was really hard for me. It was hard for me as a black man, you know, watching a woman coming from this first scene, he's, you know, in a position of power and, and truth. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, standing across from a black woman who's being accosted by a white cop and being powerless to help, being powerless to protect. Um, and then watching her watch these two black men on this side of the car who can't do anything. And again, you know, these are voices that live to tell the story afterward and, and continue to fight the fight, but, but there's a lot of voices who don't. And so we don't know what those stories were. We don't know what that situation was. Um, and so that was, that was really challenging and, and Spike brilliantly the way he put those scenes, you know, uh, yeah, sequentially. Yeah, cut together really brilliantly and yeah. from these, yeah, this position of our, of power of our characters mm -hmm. and of, of, you know, leaders and then instantly that's kind of, you know, taken away at that, that the hands of uh, racism and police brutality. He does a great service to that scene as well by not making it subtle. I think so often yeah. movies about, movies and stories about racism want to say that racism operates in subtle ways, which I, I can't necessarily say how it operates, but I think it so often does not. And I think he does a great service to that scene by making it brutal, vicious, and perverse. And, yeah. and the, the harsh cutting and the language is something that is, is quite shocking. And it makes something that we may have seen in other movies even more shocking than I think we've ever seen it before. It's a really great scene. And just to, add, you know, it's interesting now, like just listening to, you know, what you're saying about um, uh, David Duke as a speaker, too. Like in that speech, he's talking about the very thing that happens, you know, in the, in the next scene. It's just that easy. And but 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 he was considered a, a, a dangerous man, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture. He was, they were considered, you know, they were on watch list. And, and they were the biggest threat to American democracy. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, when you preach that kind of rhetoric, he's talking about love. He's talking about black love protecting ourselves. And, and that rhetoric can easily be um, Mis mistaken and, and mistook, you know, like it's it's that easy for it to go off the rails yeah. and for him to become a villain um, in the eyes of people who may follow David Duke versus understanding where he's coming from, where they, where where these people are coming from, and so you know those parallels are in this film as well, like him juxtaposed up against David Duke, and you know, and 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 so it's 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 gritty, but it's those complex sort of things that Spike is able to just kind of. Just he just takes the just swings at the bat and knocks it out the park. You know. Ron, I'm curious before before I let you go, I'm gonna tangential. I'm gonna ask you since your first job as an undercover officer was going to a uh, Stokely Carmichael speech and then afterwards infiltrating the Ku Klux Klan, what was it like as a black man in the '70s in a police force seeing the way the majority of the officers responded to or thought of someone like Stokely Carmichael versus? David Duke? Well, I understood, uh, even as I was living those events, I understood that not every officer felt, uh, felt that way. To us, it was just a job. It was just a job to go to work, be told that you have this assignment tonight, uh, we need a black face to go into this black bar, to monitor this black man who we view as a potential threat to our city because of his rhetorical powers of persuasion. And we need you to go in there and monitor it, gauge the audience reaction, and uh, report back to us as to uh, what you feel we should do, we as a police department should do for the protection of our city. For you young people in this audience, you have to understand this was about four, maybe five years removed 
from when major cities in America were burning because of the riots that took place following the death of uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, it was, America was a mess. You know, my wife and I lived through that. It was a mess. And they were concerned that Stokely might come into town and ignite the passions of our black community, and they may go bonkers. Well, he didn't. They overreacted. But we didn't know it at the time. I viewed it as just another assignment, uh, my first undercover assignment, uh, going up against the former uh, Black Panther Party leader. And uh, I didn't have any training in undercover work. I had took my uniform off for a day, dressed in my uh, flyest uh, clothes, leisure style suits and everything else, pressed my afro down and stuck my pick in my head and I uh, uh, walked into the club and uh, was amazed by what I saw, what I heard. Uh, Stokely's uh, rhetorical powers of persuasion uh, was powerful. The man was powerful. Corey does an excellent job channeling him. You know, uh, I remember listening to uh, 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 Stokely talk, and as a black man, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I agree with that. I agree with that, too. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> and I had actually raised my fist a couple of times and did like that along with the other members of the audience. And then it dawned on me, I'm here to work this guy, not to root for this guy, and I better channel, I better control, rather, what I, my response is because I'm a black man in America, but right now I'm a black cop, a cop first who happens to be black. And I had to balance those two dualities. And that's something that cops all over, black cops all over this country have to uh, deal with. We live in a white-dominated world, white-dominated society, where the members of the white community do not want to accept us because of our black skin and yet the black community that we are a part of does not want to accept us because we wear blue. Okay? We have to balance that. But I do also know that whenever I took my uniform off, put my badge out, uh, away, I'm still a black man in America. And you can't get away from that. And that's how I uh, lived my 32-year uh, career. Uh, a black man in America who happened to have a badge and enforce the law. Ron, thanks so much for being here, man. Congratulations on the movie. The movie Black Klansman opens August 10th in theaters everywhere. It's absolutely phenomenal. Go see it in the theater. It's Spike Lee like you haven't seen him before. Everybody give them a big round of applause for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you.